Hey everybody, my name's Louis. I'm the designer advocate team of Figma, and today I'm going to be running you through Figma's UI3 community file. Head over to the community and search UI3, and you'll be able to find the file and have a look at the variables, the styles, the components, everything inside. But of course, we're here to take a look, so let's open the file up. Inside the file, we've broken everything down by pages, and these are broken down by components, and by styles, colors, typography, grids, effects, everything's in here. On the overview page, if you zoom in, you can see we have some additional resources as well. These are videos recorded by the team walking through our design process or how this file came to be. Let's take a look through some of the pages. First up is typography. As you can see, Figma has a pretty minimal set of typography values. These are styles backed by variables. And if I zoom in, you can see we've got our heading slash display which if I open up and look at the settings, is all backed by variables, which I'll show you in a little bit. Zooming out and jumping over to the color page, it's pretty much the same, but you can see we have a lot more documentation in this page. If I zoom in, I'm just gonna show you this little section over here, because in the difference between UI2 and UI3 is it was introduced these pale colors. So pale persimmon, pale pink, pale yellow, were all introduced in this iteration. Additionally, and this will become clear when I show you the variables, the primitive values do have a light and dark mode variation, which is slightly different to how we normally set up design systems. Jumping to the elevations page, you can also see a slight variation in the effects between light and dark mode. On the dark mode, there's a little slight white tint that appears at the top of the shadow. And if I look on the right hand side of the file, we do have those effect styles different between light and dark mode. Let's take a look at the icons. And as you can see, there are a ton of icons in here. So I'll zoom in and just show you a few of them. In the icon guidelines file, there's some guidelines on how we set these up. So you can see all the grid that's been set up for every single icon. And taking a look at some of the icons, it should look quite familiar. So zooming down, you can see we've got our zoom in and out icons. We have our link icon. We have a Figma icon, if you ever wanna use that one. The save icon, zooming down. Again, icons that should look pretty familiar if you've used Figma before. There's also a pretty handy placeholder icon which does get used in some components where the decision is to use whichever icon makes sense for that designer. These icons are broken down into size 24 and size 16. And lastly, on the right hand side, there's an entire section for all the strokes that have been added inside our components as well. On the cursors page, these should also look pretty familiar. If I zoom in on the multiplayer cursors, you can see those familiar little cursors that we all use every day to collaborate with our colleagues. If I double click into a cursor, you can see it's actually been set up in a way that clips off that name. This helps keep it centered whenever you're using those in your design. And underneath those, we have our famous cursor chats as well. If I make the layers panel just a little bit smaller, you can see every single component has been broken down into a page. As well, we have our templates at the bottom, which I'll show you in a second. So let's take a look at a couple of these component pages. Firstly is the buttons page. There's a lot of buttons in here. These have been annotated to help you navigate them and read them a little bit better using these component labels on the left-hand side and at the top to help you identify what state or type each individual button is. You can see these are broken down into primary, secondary, and then we also have a specific button for Fig Jam, and then success, destructive, ghost, these are all pretty familiar, but you can see how these have been arranged in the file. Zooming out, there's also a lot of documentation in this file for every component. So you can see each individual Figma button has been listed out with its different state and a little sticker sheet so you can see them in light and dark mode. This is pretty comprehensive, even down to the level of the spacing required on either side of each individual button. Opening the layers panel up and the properties again, Let's jump into maybe the modals and dialogues. This is a fun one because they're quite hard to make traditionally. You either end up having to tail chase and make every single permutation of a modal or dialogue, or you build a set of them in the library with some documentation, which is how Figma's done it. If we look at some of these modals or dialogues, there's some pretty common ones. So we have our advanced sharing, we have our component for the footer, for the header, for the input. These are all sort of building blocks that come together in those dialog components. If you want to create a team, this is what that dialog looks like. If you want to share something, this is what that dialog looks like. On the right hand side, we have the documentation for each individual dialog. 
This makes it easier for any designer at Figma to come in and piece together their own dialogue using those notations and documentation pieces that have been added. Additionally, there's sizing metrics in here too. So 240, 320, 480. These are the typical sizes of a dialogue inside of Figma. Lastly, let's look at segmented control. And you can see this is also built up using the subcomponent idea and they're bundled in to a larger segmented control component. Within here, there's some notations and annotations again, and those icons have been overwritten to make them contextual for that use case. And now onto the juiciest part of the page list, the Figma templates. In here, we have editor templates, viewer templates, fig jam, dev mode, and slide templates. So if you're interested to know how the actual Figma interface came together, you can dig into the layers in these templates to see that in full glory. There's tons in here. You can even see the viewer mode in there. Lastly on the page list is a documentation components, which is pretty minimal. But if you're interested to know how Figma marks up our components, you can see them. Here are the states, here's the measurements, these are some token components and the arrows. There's one thing I haven't showed you, of course, the variables. Let's open up the variables panel in the top right hand side and take a look at what we have. There are three collections, colors, sizing and typography. Typography is grouped basically by the style. So you can see body, large, strong matches the body, large, strong style, which is backed by those individual variables. These are split into font family, font size, font weight, line height, and letter spacing. You can see some of them are aliased as well, but some of them are just raw values. Because the value set is pretty thin and pretty light, we don't need to go into much more detail other than just having those values. In sizing, there are spaces and radius variables. These are numbered for spaces and t-shirt size for radius. Figma has a pretty minimal set of radiuses or radii. So that is kept nice and lean in there. Lastly on colors, and this is the most interesting part, it's broken down into two groups. There is this little icon here to indicate semantic colors and the palette for primitive colors. Like I mentioned before, we do have those pale colors introduced in UI3, but interestingly and most importantly, those primitives are split up by mode. So light, dark, fig jam, light and dark, dev mode and slides all get a mode for each individual primitive. These are also in the same collection as the semantic variables, which again is not normally how people do things, but it makes sense for Figma. Within here, you can see some of them have an underscore on them. And this is effectively for filtering. These go to the top of the list in the variable icons when you're picking them in the color picker. And that just makes it easier to filter and adopt from a designer's perspective. Scrolling down, these are then grouped by different intention. So the BG is the background. So let's say we've got BG assistive default. As you can imagine, that group makes it very easy to search for assistive in the picker and find that default value. We have the same for Fig Jam, Measure, Selected, Handoff, all the different categories that you might expect from the Figma interface. That's the variables, that's the collections, that's the UI3. I want to give a big shout out to the Figma team behind this. There's an extensive design system team from designers to PMs to engineers who have spent years and years building this interface to then release it to the community. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.